Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the ERM training. Today, we are going to shift focus a little bit. Yesterday, we talked a lot about PIH as an enterprise, all of PIH, what, how risk management and enterprise risk management affect us as an entire organization. Today, we're going to zoom way in and talk about just PHAs and the, the risk to PHAs, how we can analyze PHAs, how we can figure out what's going on from PHAs, mostly from our desks without the travel funds that we all desperately want all the time. We have to learn to do more from where we are, so we're going to talk a lot about methods to do that. But again, I'm, I want to point out that we are shifting focus a little bit. The same methodology and the same framework that you all saw yesterday that we talked about in enterprise risk management applies here, but we're making it much more micro. This is that risk management activity. You know, when Wendell and Judy talked about silos, these, this is one of those silos. It's a very important silo. It's a, uh, it's a very important activity that we are happy that folks are already engaging on and we want people to continue with. It is not enterprise risk management. I just want to be very clear. This is risk management, which is also very important. So we're going to go through a couple of basics today, talk a little bit about what, what we want to do with PHAs, and then we're going to get into a case study. We are going to look at the risks that... Uh, that affect PHA's performance. We are going to spend a lot of time going up and down, be, uh, down the enterprise. Just as yesterday we talked about PIH as a whole enterprise and what that means, today we're going to look at the PHA entity, how all the different pieces affect the agency, and then we're going to go and drill into things as small as the AMPs and how those risk management activities affect the, the entity. We do this for a lot of reasons. There are a lot of benefits looking at the entity look. It helps us better identify trends, and it gives us a better picture of what's going on. But even more important, even if it's not our money, even if a PHA manages programs that have nothing to do with HUD, it's not our money, suppose that we don't care, right? That will affect us. It has the entire agency functions together as a whole, and so we want to be looking at it as a whole to see what's going on. The same thing goes with the AMPs. They're small. And when I say AMPs, I re I'm referring to projects, developments, whatever word you want to use, we call them AMPs. They're small, they're a, a littler piece of the whole puzzle, but they are a really good leading indicator of what could go on. So this is something that may look familiar to you. This comes out of the systems thinking tra training that a lot of us have had. The idea here being that we need to start looking at root causes and figure out what's going on to cause the overall risk. With PHAs, we like to clump these types of things into four categories, physical, financial, management, and governance. So the physical risk, we have two basic kinds. We have the actual asset risk, the risk to the thing that the property, to the roof is caving in, the sidewalks are cracked, there's you know, various issues with the house, whatever it may be, but with the actual asset that we're looking at. The second risk that we, type of physical risk that we look at is environmental. You may recall the first three rules of real estate are location, location, location. And though we're in a very different type of real estate, we have a very different motive than motivation than you know perhaps your realtor that's trying to sell your house, we are in a real estate environment. And so that location matters. Those environmental risks matter. Things like, are they in a flood zone? Are they in a Superfund site? And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The second type of risk that we're going to talk about is this financial risk. So we will spend a lot of time today talking about financials for two reasons. The first being, quite simply, this is where we have the most amount of objective information. We get our financial data schedules, our FDSs. We have financial information. It may be a little bit behind, but we have a lot of it. And that's important. So we can do a lot of objective analysis on this information from our desks. The second reason, and more important reason, is because all of these risks are interrelated. Just as that first opening slide with the overall risk bubble showed, all these things affect each other. And so eventually, even if it's a management problem or a physical problem or a governance problem, it'll show up in the financial risk. Just as, if it's just a financial problem, eventually it's going to show up in these other areas as well. And so focusing on this area where we have a wealth of knowledge and we can really dissect it helps us preempt a lot of problems and understand what's going on. 
Management risk is a little bit more difficult for us to gauge from our desks. The biggest indicator that we think about when we talk about management is occupancy or utilization if it's the HCC, HCV program. And that's because that's where we have that concrete data. We know what their occupancy or utilization rates are. It's a lot more difficult from our desk to decipher you know, how the ED is doing, the executive director, what's going on at that agency, how are they managing each of their individual programs. That's much more difficult. It requires conversations with our PHAs. But there are indicators that we can use to kind of infer what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can infer what is happening in the management of a program. And the same goes for the, for the governance piece. There aren't any very easy to obtain quantifiable indicators about whether or not governance is good or bad. That's a very objective thing. There's a lot of research on governance, and even that research doesn't always agree. But what we can do is look at how the rest of an agency is performing and see what's going on so that when we're thinking about governance and we're working with the boards and we're talking to the executive director and we're understanding the way the community sees the PHA and, and the public housing stack, we have a better understanding of how that's affecting the actual agency itself. So we'll brush on governance a little bit today, but we'll kind of go quickly through it because it's a lot harder to gauge from afar. So I show you this to emphasize what I said in the beginning. The process is the same. The cycle is the same. The, the methodology, when Wendell and Judy told you yesterday that we didn't make this up, we didn't make it up on this side either. We use best practices. This is based on the same COSO or um, ISO standards, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations or International Standard of Standards Organization. It's the same cycle. We identify the risk, we quantify the risk, we select a response, we implement, and we monitor. In PHAs, we use a national risk assessment tool to do this. So we often look at the SOFO risk assessment and we go through that process. Like I mentioned, we're going to talk about the different levels. When you saw the boxes of enterprise risk management, we've got the programs and the enterprise on the bottom. And that, we talked a lot about that yesterday. The next piece is that entity and, and AMP uh, risk. For PIH, when we're talking about it today, we're going to be referring specifically to the public housing authorities, although a lot of this will also apply to tribally designated housing authorities. We're going to be talking about a lot of tools that are only available on the public housing and voucher side, but the principles stand. We're going to look at the entity because it helps us better understand each of the pieces. It helps us better see trends across the entire organization, how one thing is affecting the other. It also helps us get a better idea of where to focus our attention, that cost-benefit analysis. If an agency has three programs, where do we start? What is driving the rest, the, the rest of the agency? Maybe it is one program that's pulling all of the rest down. It also really helps us understand how that PHA fits into its community, what it does as a whole, where, and that leads into that governance piece. What are the programs it's operating? Does it have a store that it's operating on the side, and what does that mean? So we'll look at this entire entity, because what affects one piece will eventually affect the whole. We want to start looking at all of that in one giant picture, just as yesterday we talked about with PIH, we want to look at the entire enterprise. Because if we're only focusing in on one or two little pieces, we may miss a broader effect. We're also going to talk about the smallest part of the agency. We're going to talk about the AMPs, the, the projects, the developments. We talk about this because it's a really great leading indicator for risk. If an agency has multiple properties and one is starting to fail, that often indicates that there will be issues later on in other areas. So it's one of the best ways to, to preempt issues, if we can see that in, in advance. It also helps us better identify, identify redevelopment opportunities. It helps us better decide kind of what that agency is prioritizing. And it also helps us think about some of these other bigger issues, like occupancy issues. Is, are we, do we have properties and communities that are dying and they just don't have folks? Do we have certain properties that are just in really bad condition. So we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. When we go through the case study, we're going to use this PHA analysis tool, toolbox. These are some of the tools that we have available. You heard us joke yesterday that in, in HUD we call everything a tool because it's not a system, it's just a program. We don't really know what it is. We call it all a tool. Well, here's a, a list of some of the many tools that we have available. The HCV Utilization and Two-Year Report that's found on SharePoint, that is a phenomenal tool 
for looking at how the HCV program is performing in a certain PHA. And we'll use a couple of, of reports from that tool later on this afternoon to start the conversation about the HCV program. It's a very complex program. There are a lot of parts that go into it, so we'll go through it fairly quickly, but it is a phenomenal place to start. The OFO National Risk Assessment Tool, which we today will refer to as the NRA. So when we say NRA, we're talking about that PHA risk assessment tool that OFO uses all the time. That's the NRA. That is kind of the, the backbone of our risk assessment for PHAs. How do we decide where do we focus our resources? It is not the end of that conversation. It's a good start. It helps us figure things out. And you'll hear us talk today a lot about, okay, well, that we found something out. Well, why? Let's get further into it. And this, this national risk assessment tool really helps us identify the, the questions that we need to ask. One of the other benefits of the risk assessment tool is that it is some of the most heavily QC data that we have. It pulls in data from all of the other systems that have already been QC'd, and then it QC's it again. So that's a great place. A downfall is it, it is a point in time, and it relies on the most recent data that we had at that point. We all know our FDS data is at least nine months behind. The data in the risk assessment tool may be nine months to a year behind, depending on what's going on. So that's one of the pitfalls. The PRMT is a great, it's also known as NGMS, for those of you who call it that. Every, all of these tools have different names across the country. The PRMT or NGMS is a phenomenal dashboard. It also pulls in, pulls in information from all of these different tools and helps us get a good snapshot of what's going on in various ways. And there are different parts of the PRMT. It has PIC reports. It has the HCB benchmarking tool, which is a peer-to-peer -peer analysis. It has the P public housing peer-to-peer -peer analysis. It has a lot of summary information. It's a great place to start. It, offers the most current information available as of that date. So it'll offer the PIC data from the night before at 5 p.m. or whenever it is that they sync it. So it is more up to date than the National Risk Assessment Tool. So these are the things that we're going to use today to go through and begin our analysis. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jerry, to start the, the conversation. Okay, thanks, Bailey. Um, yeah, what we're going to do is go through and use the tools that Bailey was just talking about and uh, <clears throat> go through a case study of a housing authority to uh, try to figure out what we can do and show what we can do with the tools we have to do analysis without uh, actually going to the housing authority. Uh, so to do that, the, the case study we're going to do, we're going to uh, evaluate <clears throat> the uh, PHAs, figure out uh, the universe, which one to pick, if we only have, since we only have limited resources. Uh, we're going to make a risk-based selection and then go through and do some analysis. What we can do from our desks is understand what's going on in a housing authority and uh, come up with a good list of questions to better target what we do once we, if we have the chance to get there or once we start asking detailed questions of a housing authority to make our life a little easier and uh, make our time and, and the use of our time and their time more efficient. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Starting at the top, which is uh, the universe of PHAs, what, uh, using the National Risk Assessment Tool, what you can do is you can look at this from various levels, either nationally, which is uh, this screenshot here is, is the top of the list for analyzing housing authorities for the whole country. It can also be used for, uh, at uh, the local office level, the regional level. It's a, it's a really good tool to uh, identify what's going on and uh, if what we want to do is target our resources on things that matter the most, which would mean uh, the housing authorities in the most trouble. <clears throat> what it does is there are numbers there, and you, and you can see them, but the beauty of this tool to me when I first saw it was green good, red bad, yellow kind of so-so. Uh, so <clears throat> looking at this list, it, one really kind of jumps right out at you, doesn't it? There's one that's uh, all red except for uh, HCV is yellow. So if, we're get, if we only had time to look at one housing authority and we had to pick somebody to go do it, uh, which one are you going to go to? probably Mobile Housing Authority. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of the, the morning here talking about is uh, Mobile Housing Authority. And given that it's high risk, that's always good to know. But uh, why did it become high risk? Like Bailey said, we're going to ask why a lot. 
uh, until we get down to the point where we're pretty sure we know the answers. We come up with a list of questions, and then we start uh, working with the housing authority to figure out what happened, how did it get this way, and more importantly, what do we do to try to fix it? So just from that screen, we can see Mobile Housing Board, overall risk is high. Um, and everything except for HCV, it's high risk. Um, but like I said, we need to figure out what happened. Why did it get this way? Just knowing it's high risk is not good enough. So we're going to use the tools that we have available to us to figure out what happened and how did it get that way. So for those of you familiar with the risk assessment, this is the designation sheet. There are three parts of the National Risk Assessment Tool, and they're all found on SharePoint. There is an overall display of information. It's kind of a summary designation that was developed by the Northeast Network. It does a really good job just kind of giving, giving you a high-level snapshot, especially if you're looking at a, an entire region or an area. Then there is the data tool, where we're going to spend a lot of our time today talking about different things that we can pull out of it that gives you every data point that was used to calculate every designation, and in the last tab, the actual designations. And then there's this sheet, or the where this screenshot came out of, it's a designations tool. And for those of you who use the National Risk Assessment, this is the area, the tool that you're most familiar with. This is where folks in the field are entering the risk treatment options they, they want, kind of monitoring what's happening with the agencies that are in their portfolios. This screenshot is kind of split into two because it's a very long tool with many, many columns, and they don't all fit into one screen, but it shows the, the risk profile of, of Mobile Housing Authority, what's going on there. And as Jerry mentioned, red isn't great. So if you look across, they're not, they're, they're not doing so hot in a lot of areas. One of the other really great parts about this tool is it also has these little arrows off to the side. And you'll notice that, for example, in financial, there's that little yellow square. It started as moderate, and it's gone down. It's gotten worse, and now it's high risk in that area. So it also helps us to better understand where they've come, where, where they're going, and what's happening, and to look and see what folks have said in the past that they want to do about this agency, what type of plan they have in place. So looking across, we can see that there is a lot of high-risk areas. Um, I would also point out to you that the numbers really don't matter in this. I would The colors are what counts, the focus on those. Whether it says it's 248 or 249, that really doesn't matter. What matters is the color of the, of the box. But looking at it, we can tell that there's definitely some issues that we're going to have to focus. Okay, yeah, and uh, another thing that w when we started using these tools and, and putting this together, uh, the trend arrows, um, this screen in particular and some others, as well as uh, when we get into some more detail, there's a <clears throat> trend points for risk. Those things are good when you're dealing with a high-risk housing authority to, to know that. The other thing is because we have trends and we're starting to calculate trends and we have arrows and things to point us in the right direction, as we use these going forward and you're working with housing authorities that are high performers or even moderate performers, you can start seeing these trends and when something starts to go down, hopefully we can recognize that, see it, address it with the housing authority and figure out what's going on to keep them from getting worse and worse and becoming high risk. So <clears throat> the approach to this kind of review that we do, um, there's some things we want to know so, so give us some structure to the review. So we're going to start asking some questions. You know, what is this place? If we're going to analyze an entity, we need to know what, the, what it is. How big is it? How many units do they have? What programs do they operate? Um, <clears throat> how are they doing financially? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Can they pay their bills? What's their cash balance? Um, <clears throat> are they succeeding in providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing? That's really the most important thing. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what HUD does. HUD provides funding to, to agencies to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing for people that need it. If they're not doing that, then there's a big problem. What, if they aren't, why not? Um, what else is causing the distress? Is it, is it governance or management? Um, is federal revenue going down? That's a problem. You know, there's the government's basically been out of money for a long time. Uh, they just keep making more. So, you know, the budget's not going to get any better anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> failing state and local programs, do they operate other things? If they do, and they're starting to go bad, sooner or later, if it hasn't impacted the money that HUD's giving this agency, it probably will. And uh, what about expenses? If revenue's going down or expenses going up at the same time? If they are, then that's probably a problem. So... 
those are the things we're going to focus on and, and try to answer the questions. How are we going to do that? We're going to start at the top again by uh, figuring out what is the entity structure, using the tools to do that. There's some pretty good stuff there. Uh, and then we're, because, as Bailey said, that's where we have the most information, the most data, we're going to start by looking at their finances and figure out what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> once we do that at an entity level, then we're going to start going down and figuring out what programs that they operate are having the most impact on the distress at the agency. And then once we get done, we'll summarize what we have, come up with the questions, what other additional information do we need from the agency, and then, uh, then it's time to go develop a plan and work with them to try to make it better. So taking a moment to quickly explain this slide, you'll see up in the corner that box that lists all the different levels and layers of programs that we're going to look at. In this case, we're looking at entity. That's why it's highlighted in red. And then across the bottom, you see the indicators that are in the national risk assessment tool for each of those areas. So looking at the entity-wide indicators, we can see what's what we are judging in the National Risk Assessment Tool. We aren't looking at any physical indicators because those are program specific, either the HCV or public housing. There are several financial indicators that we're going to look at. We're going to talk a lot about the quick ratio and what that means, what goes into it. Interfund transfers we obviously have to look at from that entity level because it's transfers among programs and so it doesn't happen within one program. Uh, bank overdrafts. When we talk about bottom line, you'll hear us interchange the words bottom line and um, talk about the FDS line item 10,000. So we'll talk about that a lot. We'll look at management. This is a, a good area to look at entity-wide. Anytime you see something that says QAS, that's a quality assessment survey, that's a survey that the folks in OFO do each year, twice a year, to assess their, their group of PHAs that they're looking at, how they feel that agency is doing. Because, as we mentioned before, there are a lot of things, especially in management and governance, that we can't tell from the data, that we need to listen to our analysts and see what they have to say about it because they're working with these agencies every day. And then we look at governance at this level. This is the only level we look at governance, this whole entity wide, because that's what governance does is it manages the entire entity. So these are some of the indicators we look at when we're talking about governance. So the next tool that we're going to use to kind of get into this, to start thinking about that first question that Jerry asked, is the PRMT. As I mentioned, this is more of a dashboard. It displays information. It's also known as NGMS. It is, we like to joke that it is the window into our agencies, as so beautifully depicted on the opening page of the PRMT. But it's a great place to go and get basic information about what's going on. It has some analysis tools in it. Like I mentioned, it's up to date. There are a lot of things happening and changing in this tool. It is a great place to keep checking back. There's more stuff being added and stuff is, is moving around a bit and getting better and better. So we'll start looking at that tool. <clears throat> okay, so this is the PHA overview in the PRMT and it contains a lot of the information that you'd want to know if you're going to go to a housing authority that you haven't dealt with before. Um, it gives you uh, the revenue that they have for Section 8 and 9, as well as uh, another thing that's, that's very interesting if you're trying to figure out a housing authority. You can look in that box that's at the top left right away and see they have uh, a significant amount of other revenue, which means, yes, they are operating programs that don't come from our money, from our Section 8 or Section 9 money. So something to write down, make a note of, and make sure that we understand what that is by the time we get done tells you how many public housing units, and it also uh, tells you what their uh, current occupancy rate is. So this place has a little over 3,400 units, but they're only 74% occupied. That's a problem. Uh, anybody that's dealing with housing authorities knows 74% occupancy is not good. Um, we need to make sure we understand what's going on there. They do have some units that are designated for redevelopment. That could be part of it. But uh, definitely need to know as we go on, what's going on there? Why are they so low on occupancy? Uh, housing choice vouchers. A lot of housing choice vouchers out there. But uh, <clears throat> they're only at about 76% uh, utilization rate. But they're using 95% of their money. That we got to understand what's going on there. 95% is okay. It's not great as far as utilization of their money. But uh, when they're only got 76% utilization, we got to make sure we understand what's going on there. Is it a management problem, governance problem? Maybe it's a problem in the community and, and there's just not enough people that want to use them. We don't know. 
but definitely things that just by looking at this one screen, we've got some indication of some issues. We got to, we're starting our list of questions to go figure out what's going on. So from that, we learned a lot. <clears throat> we know they have a board. We, there's names on the prior sheet that tells you who the contact information is. Um, they own or and or manage 13 properties. They got about 4,000 housing choice vouchers. Some other places you can go that, that are tools that you can use to figure out things about housing authorities. Most large housing authorities these days have their own website. There's a lot of good information there. If they're uh, getting into uh, redevelopment, if they've got a big thing going on, they're, they're usually very proud of that. It'll be on their website, and if it's not, there's probably news articles in uh, local newspapers, et cetera, that'll tell you what's going on. Um, <coughs> they're audited financial statements. The financial statements themselves, as well as the notes of the financial statements and the management discussion analysis that we'll talk about in a little bit, gives you a lot of information on what's going on at the housing authority, what kind of programs they run, uh, what things they're doing lately. Um, <coughs> Talking to other HUD offices. Um, it, it, we saw, got an indication from the pre previous screen that uh, there, there were some units designated for redevelopment. Get a hold of the special application center, see what's going on. Have there been any problems? What's, what's the deal going on there? Um, a lot of places are trying to get into the RAD program. Talk to those people, see if they've put in an application. Um, and then conversations with the PHA. You know, we can do a lot of stuff from our desk with just the data we have available, but uh, we also have to talk to and work with the PHA to make sure we understand what's going on. As Bailey mentioned, especially with financial information, a lot of that's nine months old. Has anything changed? Have they done anything new? We've got to make sure we communicate and know what's going on. So taking a look at this slide again, I'm going to take a second to explain it because you'll see this throughout the presentation. We're looking at how they're performing financially, as you can see in the title. And on the corner, you can see that we're going to be looking at the entity level, the public housing level, um, and the development and the development and HCV level. We're looking at all of them, and each of the boxes represent a different one of those levels. So the top box is the development, and then program, and then entity. And we can tell from this, this is just kind of a, a quick way to put in all the indicators because, again, as I mentioned, there are a lot of indicators, and you can't see it on one screenshot. And so we're trying to look at some of the the things that we have to look at financially when we're looking at the development. We can see that they have 13 amps, which we learned from the PRMT as well. And when we say MINAR, 6 out of 13, had issues, what we're saying is 6 out of 13 of those amps got points in the risk assessment for, for their MINAR because it was below the standard that was accepted. And so you'll see that down the, down the slide. We, we can point out that we've got MINAR issues. There's a MINAR trend issue. MINAR, for those of you who aren't immersed in this all the time, we'll, we'll delve into nerd speak every now and then. We'll talk about a lot of numbers. That's the month's expendable net asset ratio. It's how much money do they have in their savings? Do they have enough to pay their bills with that? How many months can they operate on those reserves is what we call their savings. Then we've got DSCR, which is the debt service coverage ratio. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but we can see five out of 13 of those amps have it and have, a, it, have an issue with that. And we'll talk about that because a lot to most of our properties don't have debt. So if they're having issues with their debt service coverage ratio, how much the debt they can pay down, that's probably something we want to understand what's going on there. And then OER stands for operating expense ratio. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide. Here, and then they can see some of the other financial indicators. We can see that they had an admin shortfall issue. Something's happening with their admin shortfall and the H, with their admin fees in the HCV program. So we'll talk about that later on. And then if we look at entity-wide, we can see that their quick ratio is okay, but they have quick ratio trend points, so it's going down. So we need to dissect and figure out what's happening there. And their cash trend is also going down. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, diving into these indicators a little bit more um, in depth and seeing what's going on. But this gives us just kind of a screenshot of what we can see financially just from the National Risk Assessment Tool. At this point, we haven't gone beyond that. This is what we can tell that we already know we have a bunch of questions to ask. So we'll start with uh, the financial entity-wide. 
So this is, uh, again, a portion of the screen. It goes way, way, way farther over to the right. So we'll start at the left and work from there. Uh, so the financial section, we got a uh, quick ratio, which is basically, do they have enough money to pay their current bills for people that aren't accountants and, and don't love accounting speak. Um, it, it's uh, total cash divided by their uh, current liabilities. Um, most accountants and w would think anything more than two is typically okay. So 4.51 actually looks pretty good. But as Bailey said, if you, you go uh, two columns to the right, quick ratio trend. That means if there's any points there, regardless of the number, that means it's going in the wrong direction. In, in any of these screens when you're using this tool, if there are trend points, it means that if, if up is bad, it's going up. If down, it's bad, it's going down. Uh, it's, going in, it's going the wrong way. So uh, we definitely got some issues there. Uh, if we go on to the right, $11.9 million. I would love to have that. I don't. Um, so I'm here. Uh, but uh, again, to the right, cash trend, 10 points. That means cash is going down. 11.9 million is not necessarily a bad number, but it's going the wrong way. Um, FDS 10,000, that's uh, for those that don't like to memorize line numbers and FDSs, uh, that's their bottom line. Did they make money or lose money? In this case, they lost $12.5 million in the last year could have something to do with the trend points and the quick ratio on cash. But we don't know that for sure. Maybe it didn't. Maybe they had a whole boatload of money. Um, Interfund transfers is always a concern. Um, in this case, they, they didn't get any uh, risk points for it, but $902,000 is a pretty significant amount of money. Uh, just to, uh, we'll address that right now because we're not going to talk about it anymore. There is enough data here to go through and look, and uh, none of those transfers were between HUD programs. So uh, we're not going to talk about that anymore today, but uh, definitely something to look at anytime there's a dollar amount there. Um, <clears throat> bank overdrafts, we got zeros the rest of the way across. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time, uh, we'll start with the quick ratio. Yes, well, question. Um, 10 cash trend points. What that means is uh, th there's a lot of math that's way more complicated than I ever learned how to do to figure out how many points they get for the trend. But if there's any, any time there's a number in one, of the cash tr in one of the trend columns, that means it's going the wrong direction. Whatever's bad, that's what it's doing. So in this case, cash going down is bad. So they have $11.9 million. It was more than that before. So we're going to start by uh, looking at the quick ratio. Like I said, 4.5 is, is not bad, but it's going the wrong way. So the nice thing about this tool is for any of the numbers that are calculated or shown on the summary pages, if you go to one of the other sheets, in this case the scores PHA sheet, it shows you the information that went into that uh, calculation. So we can see a couple of years ago, the <clears throat> this goes from right to left, it was 7.8, now it's 4.5. That explains why they got the trend points. It's going down. It's going down pretty quick, 43% uh, over the past three years, uh, which is, again, you know, nice information, good to know. We love numbers. We're accountants. Um, well, some of us are, anyway. And, uh, but we still don't know why. What's causing it? Two things can impact quick ratio, cash or payables. We already saw on the prior screen they're having an issue with cash. So... Uh, it makes sense to just start there and look a little closer and uh, see what we can find out. Ten trend points, that means cash is going down. Again, <clears throat> go to this, whoop, excuse me. If you go to one of, one of the other detail sheets, which is the FDS PHA sheet, this is all the information that went into calculating cash and the quick ratio. So <clears throat> what we see here, you know, we can see the issue with cash. It was $21 million two years ago. Now it's down to 11.9. That's not good. The other thing that uh, we like to do in this kind of analysis, especially in a place that's gotten this bad, um, is uh, look at cash in a little more detail. This shows what went into calculating it. That They used the this calculation in the NRA tool uses total cash. But uh, those of us that work with PHAs know that not all cash at a PHA in the bank is created equal. 
there is some cash that can only be used for certain things. It's called restricted cash. It shows up separate on the FDS. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this in a little more detail, there's total cash 11.9 right next to it, highlighted in yellow. That's unrestricted cash. That's the cash that this housing authority actually has available to pay their current bills. And there's an, another number that's 1.5 million that uh, is cash restricted for payment of current liabilities. Since the quick ratio is a calculation of what money do they have to pay their current liabilities, add those two together, that's really what they have right now in the bank available to pay their current bills. So to get a little better look at what the current situation really is at this housing authority, I went through and uh, recalculated the quick ratio just using just the cash they have available to pay their bills. And uh, if you do that, now all of a sudden the situation doesn't look quite as good. As I said, any, typically anything two or more is considered okay, but uh, they're down to 2.4. They're getting very close to the level that uh, most accountants, if they were working with some place and saw 2.4, they'd start telling them, you need to start doing something because you get, you're starting to get into trouble. So <clears throat> definitely something worth doing. The information, like I said, is available in the NRA tool to go through and redo that calculation and use just the unrestricted cash. And it's a good thing to do <clears throat> when you're working with a housing authority that's starting to have financial difficulty. The other thing with, with uh, when you're doing that is, is if you look at this housing authority and you go through and you recalculate the cash, you see that $3.8 million is all they have available for the daily operations, and that's going down faster than total cash. They got trend points for total cash going down. That was down to $11.9 million. Their unrestricted cash is actually going down at a faster rate. It's down 70% over the last three years. So <clears throat> we're really getting a little more concerned about this place every, every time we look at something. So, and while that graph comes from Jerry's brain, Jerry made that fancy graph, all the data is available in the, in the National Risk Assessment data sheet. So that's where you can pull that information without having to go and get the FDS, the FDS for each of those years. So, what's causing all this? They lost $12.5 million, but when we were looking at that before, they didn't have any trend points for that, which was interesting. So it left us wondering, you know, is this a new thing? Were they making money all, all the way up to this year? Well, not quite. Um, they made money two years ago. But uh, <clears throat> the place has been uh, tanking and tanking pretty quickly. They're down $16.75 million over the last two years, actually, because they made money to the, the first year of this three-year trend. So we really need to understand what's causing that. Again, we're just going to keep asking why until we get to the end, because uh, you know, knowing that they're losing money is one thing. We've got to know why before we can actually help them fix it. So we're going to spend some more time looking into the details of, of uh, what's causing them to to be losing all that money. They, they, we know they operate a bunch of programs. Which ones are causing the problem? So one of the places that we can go to look and find out, it's really find out what the housing authority says the problem is. There's the management discussion analysis that comes with uh, every audited submission that, that's uh, loaded up into the uh, REACT fast public housing system. And that is, uh, it's at the beginning of the audit report when it comes in, and it really is, even though we know a lot of the auditors actually write it for the housing authority, it's how the housing authority management's opportunity to tell us what happened this last year. So if you go up into the, F, into the fast public housing system and, and get the one from Mobile Housing Authority, this is uh, only part of it because I didn't want to take six slides to put the whole thing up. But really, <clears throat> you read this, and, uh, and look at what it is they're saying is causing all these problems and what it comes down to, basically, if you spend some time to analyze it, is we didn't give enough, enough money, therefore they're losing money, is really what it comes down to. Federal revenue is down significantly over the last year. Um, some other things that, uh, that they identify that are, that are good to know and make a note of as we go forward is they do indicate that they are... Uh, aggressively pursuing uh, uh, getting their units fixed up and reoccupied. 
and we saw at the beginning that they're only 74% occupied. So as we go forward, looking at that, keeping that in mind when we look at their expenses to see uh, if their expenses are high in certain areas, does that make sense given what they say they're doing? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And also to uh, really come to a, a conclusion or at least an opinion on our part as to whether that this initiative they have going on is really doing any good. So <clears throat> on the next screen, <clears throat> the, the other thing that we have in the uh, management discussion analysis is there's tables that come along with it that uh, for various things, in this case it's funding because they said that funding went down. The numbers that they put in this table actually support what they said as far as revenue going down. But if, if you go through, and like I said, I didn't put the whole F MDNA in here because it would just take too long. But reading through it, you can find out some other things. Total revenue did re decrease, but total expenses went up by 4.2%. So that's really not a real good combination. Now, there could be some very valid reasons for that. But on the surface, at least, what it indicates is management's not doing what they need to do to make sure they keep their expenses in in control, especially given they lost $12.5 million. They know revenue's going down, they told us. But expenses continue to go up. So it really starts to, to bring into question, how is management doing? What are they focusing on? What's the board doing when they get all this information? To uh, try to make sure that the management of their housing authority is doing their job properly. So one of the other great tools that is in the PRMT, it's a tab within there, um, is this peer-to-peer -peer analysis tool. And this peer-to-peer -peer analysis tool looks at only the public housing program. We'll talk a little bit later on about the HCV benchmarking tool, which does the same thing for the HCV program. But it compares the housing authority to its peers, being those agencies that are in the same size category and relatively the same geographic location. And so this is mobile compared to their peers. It doesn't, um, it's not perfect. Obviously there are, you know, every agency is, a, is different. They're all snowflakes. They all have different issues and different things happening in different communities. But it does give us a good opportunity to kind of look and see how are things going. So we know Mobile's cash is going down a bunch. We know that, you know, they, they don't have a great MENAR. So what does the, rest, the rest of the community look like? And from this, we can see a lot of things. We can see that their costs are still above the, those of their peers. And as a note, this is per unit per month cost. So it doesn't only cost them, you know, I think it says $781. It costs them significantly more than $781 a year to operate their business. That's $781 per unit per month. But if you look, their peers, it costs them about $700. So that's significantly more, especially when you're multiplying it out by the 3,000 units of public housing that we saw that they had. We can also see that their administrative expenses are a little bit less than their average and than their peers. So we kind of wonder why. If their costs are so high and it's not administrative expenses, where is it? They said in their in their MDNA that they wanted to do a bunch of rehab and make the units better, so maybe it's in their maintenance. And from there, we can see that in their total maintenance costs, they are slightly higher, um, not a ton, but they're a little bit. But all in all, their total expenses are greater than their peers by 11.6%. You can add those all up and figure that math out on your own if you want. So it does make us question, what's going on? If we know that their cash is going down and their expenses are up, why? Where, where are they spending their money? Why are they prior, what are they prioritizing? Why are they spending more than their peers? Is there something unique happening at Mobile? As we said in the beginning, you know, these tools are phenomenal for finding the questions. We can find a lot of the answers, many of them, but some of them still require further digging, more tools, or actually talking to the PHAs. So, yeah, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. I want to, um, just for those of folks who may not clearly understand that it is when we talk about cash going down, it almost makes it sound in the write-up in the audit and looking at this that it's because we didn't fund them. And that is a true statement. But we didn't fund them probably pretty much because they haven't done something right. When you leave your unit vacant for a long period of time, you don't get money for those units. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure that we're going to get into this as the session continues, but it's important for those. So someone at first glance might say, well, we didn't fund them because of the cuts that Congress made. When in fact, 
that's partially true. There's other situations where we didn't fund them because they didn't do something correctly in the way they operate the housing authority. So just off the two sides. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Lindsay. I think that that is really important. That why don't why is the cash going down? What's happening? And yeah, you know, funding has gone down. We all know that, but. Funding's been going down for all of our agencies. So why is it especially hitting Mobile? And as Lindsay pointed out, there's other things. We already know they've got 74% occupancy. Well, at that rate, they're not getting funded for most of those units that are vacant. And so that's probably a great source of that cash declining. They're also not getting tenant revenue. So they're not getting money from us. They're not getting money from their tenants. What are they doing? And that's a really phenomenal point. And they probably didn't cut staff. Yeah, so why? Why is their funding... Uh, or why is their cash declining? It's a great question. Or a great point, sorry. Sean. Uh, total non operating expenses for Mobile is 230 PUM and for everyone else it's like 170. What's going on there? Good question. <laughs> yeah, total non operating expenses it, yeah, it is way higher than their peers. Uh, the, other, the other one that uh, anytime I see the word other, uh, I start to get concerned. And uh, because it makes me wonder. Do they understand what they're doing and why couldn't they figure out what it was and tell us it is part of it. So again, it gets to uh, management and the competency of the staff. But other general expenses are also significantly more than their peers. So definitely two things. Anytime, yeah, other general expenses, non-operating expenses, what are those things? We need to know. So uh, and as far as revenue going down, why did it go down? What caused it? What, it might have just been budget cuts. It could have been a lot of other things. So. And as Lindsay mentioned, there are a lot of factors. So who knows? Maybe there's a really good reason. There may be a very, very reasonable explanation. It may be that, you know, that it costs a lot more in these areas to operate in Mobile. We don't know that sitting at our desk without a little more research. But it does make us ask that question. Why? What is different about Mobile than the rest of their peers? Yeah, so to start to try to figure it out, we're, we're going to start, we, we've got a pretty decent idea of what the questions are from the entity as a whole. Now it's time to start figuring out what is causing the problem. <clears throat> they lost $12.5 million. Which parts of the Housing Authority, what programs that they operate are causing that problem? Um, maybe some of them are making money, others aren't. Um, for uh, a quick one-year look at uh, what's going on, I find the uh, <clears throat> the FDS out of the financial submission a good place to go. The entity-wide FDS revenue and expense summary gives you one column for each program. You know all the elements that go into it, and you can look at uh, the individual expenses if you want to, or if you just want a quick shot at what's what's making money, what's losing money. It's a quick and easy place to go. <clears throat> go download that report. And uh, <clears throat> for an entity this size, it, it's very, very wide. So rather than taking three screens or trying to break it up, went through and just pulled out the ones that are losing money. And they've got problems in more than just one place. The project total is low rent public housing plus capital fund. Um, there's 9.2 out of the $12.5 million right there. Uh, housing choice vouchers is another 1.7. There's the bulk of it, our two major programs operated at this housing authority are both losing money uh, by a significant amount. Um, the COCC is not supposed to lose money. That's supposed to be a self-sustaining thing. Um, it's losing money. What's going on there? And then uh, we, we saw that they had a lot of other revenue and those things show up in, in uh, the discreetly presented component unit and uh, blended component unit columns. All of those are losing money. So that starts to tell us, uh, as we saw on the first screen when we were looking at just what is the entity, they had a lot of other revenue. Most of that revenue is probably going into those two columns and they're losing money. If it hasn't started to already, if that goes on too long, at most housing authorities that uh, we've been to over the years, when, when, their, when their programs start losing money, it starts to cause problems with ours. So, um, you know, even though that's really not much of the $12.5 million, if it goes on too long, it's going to start causing a problem. So we need to figure out what those are and uh, why they're losing money. So to get a little more detail, if anybody's ever tried to download three or four years of FDSs and line up all the rows and make sure you got it all right and, and do trend analysis, it's really kind of a pain. 
Um, <clears throat> when I first started putting this together and started using these tools and got into the uh, PRMT and there's an ad hoc reporting feature in there that goes in and draws data from the FDSs and you can pull as many years as you want. You can tell it, it, it does all the programs, but you can tell it which line items out of the FDS you want. If you want all of them, you can take all of them. If you only want some, you can take some. And it actually pulls it out into an Excel spreadsheet and you don't have to go through and line up all the rows and stuff. It's really cool. So <clears throat> it's gonna make our life a lot easier when we go out and do these housing authorities because something that would have taken us two or three days takes us about 15 minutes. So once you, if you don't do it very often, you have to figure, remember how to do it again. But <laughs> once you remember how to do it, it's really neat. So uh, use that to come up with this. And this is just a portion of it to start looking at the, the programs we just saw that we know are losing money um, <clears throat> to, to get a little better idea. How long have they been losing money? Is this a new thing? Was it just this year? Has it been going on for a while? And uh, broke it up into a few screens. I got a lot more data, but just put enough in here to really illustrate you know, what you can do and what kinds of things you can figure out with a few clicks of a button. So uh, the public housing program. So what's going on? The, the revenue, as they said, it's going down. We still don't know quite why, but it's going down for sure. Uh, but what's going on with total expenses? Revenue's going down, total expenses are going up. Not a good thing. Clearly shows it's been going on for, for a couple of years now at least. Only have three years here. It may have been going on for longer than that. We don't really know for sure. But uh, clearly management doesn't appear to be doing a good job of focusing on their expenses and making sure they're operating within their means for the public housing program. And we'll see as we go through, it's kind of a common trend here. Business activities, uh, this is another one in addition to the component units. These are their things. These are the things they're doing. The business activities one really caused me some heartburn when I saw it because you can see total revenue is not just down a little bit. It's way down. It's almost gone. But in the last year, $50,000 in revenue and almost $700,000 in expenses. That's a problem. Because what that appears, you know, it, it, before you go and ask them, what it looks like is maybe this was something that was operated with a state or local grant and they lost the grant. You know, possibly. Don't really know for sure just by looking at the numbers, but that's something that if that's something that, that they're really attached to and really want to keep doing, if they don't get another grant, they're going to go find a pot of money somewhere and start using it until they find another grant. So that's something to definitely uh, write down, maybe do a little online research, see if you can figure out what happened. And if not, definitely one of the first questions on the list is what's going on there. Um, Component units we saw, you know, they're, they're losing money. And a lot of the same trend as you go through these is, is revenues going down, but expenses aren't, if they're going down at all, they're not going down as fast as revenue is. So there, there's definitely uh, some issues going on here that we need to make a note of and understand. Housing Choice Vouchers is losing money. COCC is losing money. So... <clears throat> All that analysis to figure out what's causing the problem. So now we got we know the, our two biggest programs of this housing authority are losing money. And then we've got some, some of their other <clears throat> state and local programs and the central office cost center. We've got to focus on those. You know, we don't want to spend time looking at things that, that uh, really aren't, aren't contributing to the issues. So with all that analysis, with data that we have available to us, we can really go through and in a relatively short period of time, go through and do some analysis and really target what it is we spend our time on, spend time asking them questions about getting more information to figure out what's going on at this place and how do we fix it. So with that, I think right here's a good time to take a break. So we'll come back in uh, 10 minutes and then we'll continue on. Going to continue on, and like I said, uh, now's the time to start going through and uh, looking at the individual programs. Uh, now that we have a pretty good idea what's going on entity wide, we need to figure out you know what's going on with. with uh, we'll start with the public housing program. Yes. Quick question. So, do we have do we need a particular privilege to access the tool? 
That's a great question. So the question um, is, do you need a particular pr privilege to access the OFO NRA tool? It's on a SharePoint site, and you'll need to get permission from the administrator, who I believe is Mike Worrell. Uh, but for the most part, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, for PIH staff, that is accessible. Um, our DEC folks use it every now and then, too, because they do a lot of the works that we do, even though they're not in PIH. So it is accessible. Okay, so <clears throat> um, going forward, we're going to start uh, by looking at public housing. We're going to get into uh, looking at the individual properties, amps, whatever we want to call them today, uh, and see... What kind of things can we figure out by uh, using the tool and and looking at the data that we have? So again, one of the beauties of these tools, there are numbers. We don't need to understand how the numbers were calculated. One number being bigger than the other, uh, not really that big an issue. Green good, red bad, yellow kind of so-so. Um, so if you take a look at the, the, the amps for, <coughs> excuse me, Mobile, Definitely got some issues. There's some red stuff going on there. Um, so we have one, two, three properties that are overall unweighted score classified as high risk. And uh, then a couple columns to the left of that, there's this thing called it's insufficient data. Um, can you explain that? Yeah, insufficient data is a, is a new-ish metric that the, the team that puts this together is using. Um, it came out in the penultimate version, so it would have been quarter two of fiscal year 15. But the idea being, there wasn't enough data for the team to calculate accurately a risk score for this, this PHA, or for this AMP. And so that's really important for us to know, because we, we want to think about why isn't that data there? What's happening? And especially if it's one AMP and not the rest, is it is it a past score appeal, did something not get submitted properly, what's happening in that one particular place. And so it helps us to kind of not only know what questions to ask, and it definitely draws our attention to an AMP. If I see an area with insufficient data, it doesn't matter to me if they don't have a high risk score. I'm going to want to know why does this AMP not have it. But it also helps us better QC our data, get a better understanding of what's in our systems now and what we're missing. So it kind of serves a dual purpose. Um, and I would point out that um, it also helps, so I'm going to just kind of name these PHA or these AMPs now because we're going to talk a lot about the same AMPs. This, this gives us a general score, right? So this is all the indicators of that giant spreadsheet where there's a bunch of columns out to the right that don't fit on the screen. This is the the accumulation of all of that, and we can see we we see Roger Williams Homes, Thomas James Homes, Josephine Allen that doesn't have the data, so we know we want to check on them, and then we've got um, RV Taylor and Central Plaza. So just putting that in your head as you go through the analysis, like we already know that these are the five areas, these five amps that we want to think about. Where are they showing up in the rest of the analysis? Where else do they come out? So that's one of the things that we this sheet helps us do is get a really broad look. It also tells us how many units they have. So you'll notice that of the five amps I just named, those are the ones that have the most number of units. They're the biggest amps. So we also really want to ask questions about that. Often if you see an agency that has, you know, one one amp that only has like five or ten units, you know that they're probably redeveloping or moving around and if there's issues there, yeah, that matters. We want to know what's happening. But with our limited resources, we're not going to focus as much attention on it. But if it's their biggest project and it's got issues, we want to know what's happening. Yeah, so let's see if we can figure it out. There's lots more data in the tool that we can use to try to figure these kinds of things out. So moving on to uh, th this is, uh, on the spreadsheet, it kind of keeps going to the right. whole mm -hmm. bunch more stuff. Uh, this is the financial section. So we'll start looking at the... The, the financial elements that went into the overall score for those amps. And uh, again, there's, uh, there's columns that, that are risk, me and our risk. These are some of the stuff we saw earlier, most suspendable net assets ratio. Uh, there's a number there, um, but then to the right of it, there's me and our risk and me and our trend risk. So uh, <clears throat> th this one sheet will tell us, do they have issues with me and our today and if they don't, or even if they do, which way is it going? Is it trending down? Is it going in the wrong direction? 
So we can see uh, we have some of them are the same ones we saw on the prior screen, but there's some others that start jumping up here. Um, <clears throat> we have not just five, but one, two, three, four, five, six housing, uh, six amps that have uh, mean R risk, and most of those also have trend risk. So we've got a, several properties out of their 13 that uh, are getting low on their uh, reserves and getting worse. So uh, debt service coverage ratio. Uh, we talked about that a little earlier. Debt is, because of RAD and other things in, in the public housing world, becoming more common at properties at public housing authorities, but not real common. So uh, in addition to looking at the, whether they have debt and whether there's a, a risk associated with it, uh, when you're working with housing authorities in, uh, in the group of housing authorities that you deal with every day, if you look at this screen and you see a debt service coverage issue at a housing authority that you didn't know had debt, mm -hmm. definitely something you want to go check out. Uh, make sure that uh, the property that it's associated with, if it does have, it could be a mistake. You know, as much as we quality control stuff, errors can happen. It might just be wrong, but if it's not and you didn't know about it, that means they potentially encumbered one of our properties without telling us, and that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> But uh, we got a, a number of properties at Mobile that uh, have debt service coverage and uh, don't have enough money to cover the debt service. Uh, that's what uh, the ratio calculates, and if there's risk points associated with it, that means that that's the issue. Um, the operating expense ratio is a calculation determining whether or not they have enough revenue to cover their operating expenses. Um, so basically another way of looking at bottom line, but we do it for the AMP instead of the entity as a whole. Uh, we got a number of properties that uh, appear to be losing money every year. And uh, so we start to look at, as we did from the entity to the individual programs, now we're breaking down the public housing program and figuring out what parts of that program are causing the problem. So we've definitely got some issues here with uh, low reserves and, and some amps that aren't bringing in enough revenue to cover their expenses. Um, all good to know, but again, why? Question. Yes, uh, I understand OER is operating expense ratio. How does operating expense ratio relate to mean our risk? Um, well, if you lose money long enough, you start burn, burning up your reserves. So the relationship would be there. I mean, it, it's not a direct rate. You, you can have one and not the other. If they, if they have high reserves and they just started losing money, then they, they, it'll take them a while to burn through the reserves before the reserve ratio becomes a problem. So that's why if you see some that have an operating expense ratio issue, but they don't have a mean R issue, it's because they probably just started losing money. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. If they have both, it's a, it's a bigger problem. So, but good question. So we looked at a little bit the, the different indicators for financial. We've talked a lot about that. We're gonna talk a little bit briefly about management. Um, again, this is a harder area to, to discuss from afar because it really, when we talk about management, there's a lot of things that we can only know by talking to folks. But we can look at some things from afar. Um, looking at the indicators that are in the National Risk Assessment Tool, you can see that some of the things that, the, the bulk of what we look at is occupancy-related stuff. We've got a 12-month average occupancy, which comes out of PIC. That's using a 12-month average from PIC as of the point in time that they pulled it. Um, and you can see here at Mobile, 9 out of 13 of those amps had issues in this area, which would explain that 74% occupancy we saw in the PRMT. Like they are having problems occupying their units. The trend is the same thing. It's going the wrong way. So we can see 4 out of 13 amps, their occupancy is getting worse. Um, and then the next step, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of specifically which amps those are. And you'll probably recognize a lot of the names from, from the first slide when we looked at the amps. But what, a couple of the things that we have in here are long-term vacant and overage HUD approved vacant. So long-term vacant, those units that are more than 365 days vacant. That is important for us because why is a unit vacant for 365 days? What's going on? Um, these are things that, you know, maybe there's some mod, maybe there's something else happening. Maybe they just did it, made a mistake and pick. But any unit 
anywhere that's vacant for 365 days is going to start to deteriorate. It's going to start causing issues. And so that's the thing that we definitely want to know why, what is happening. That's a really important indicator. The next thing, the overage HUD approved vacancy, you'll see that there's an, it says advisory. And that's because we have some, um, some issues with PIC. It's hard for us to, to know exactly when an agency was approved in PIC and some of the data just doesn't line up. So we haven't included any risk points in it, but it's an important area to look. At Mobile, it's not an issue, but it's an important place to look. Are, what are these HUD approved vacancies and have they been, um, are they overage? Are we not approving them? What's happening? Why? And it's also nice to know, to be frank, what are these unapproved vacancies? What are we giving them permission to leave unoccupied? Are they police units? Are they mod rehab? What's happening there? Like I said, it's not really an issue at Mobile, but it is something that we look at. It's an advisory indicator in the National Risk Assessment in the data tool you can look at. Then the other very obvious things are, are the TARS, which is also part of our FARS or our FAS indicator. So tenant accounts receivable, basically how much money are the tenants paying us? Um, and we can see that there are some issues here. And in a little while, Jerry will talk about the intersection between trying to occupy units and get our occupancy rate up and that tenant accounts receivable, receivable number and how that affects our finances as well because we want to make sure that everything is in balance. These are all big, big programs to operate and we want to balance all the different areas. Again, QES is a quality assessment survey. I, as somebody who I'm probably less familiar with this PHA. If it's not in my portfolio, it's not an agency I look at all the time, I pay a lot of attention to those QAS, to that quality assessment survey, those points, because that's what the analyst on the ground, the person who's looking at it every day, thinks there's something happening here. There's something that's not being caught in the data, or it is being caught in the data and it's really bad still. And so if you're not familiar with the PHA, that's a really great place to look. If it is a PHA you're very familiar with, you probably know exactly what this issue already is because you filled out the question yourself, so you know these things. These are the management indicators that we can take a look at. Okay, so we'll uh, look at the detail that went into the, the summary we were just looking at, and uh, as Bailey mentioned, when, when you go to the detail and you start looking at which of the amps that, uh, that are having problems, uh, the, the names look a lot awful familiar. Roger Williams Homes, Thomas James Place, Josephine Allen, Central Plaza Towers, the same ones that we saw on the first sheet that were, uh, <clears throat> that were problems, uh, ha definitely have problems. So uh, start looking in a little more detail. Occupancy for all of those, 35.27%. Uh, go down to Josephine Allen Homes, 2.4% occupied. You see something like that, and, and any kind of analysis you're doing, when you start looking at numbers and, and details, some things just kind of don't make sense. It's like 2.4%, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. um, my, when you first see that and you don't know anything about it, it's like, that, that's got to be a mistake. That can't be right. Um, but we've got to make a note of it and figure it out. Is it right? Is it not? Um, and, uh, you know, occupancy ch risk, occupancy change risk. Um, you see some of these 35.27 uh, uh, at Roger Williams home and you go to change risk that means that occupancy change is going in the wrong direction it means it's going down so it's 35.27 it was higher before that's a problem um, long-term vacancy uh, some of the same properties not only are they do they have low occupancy but it's been that way for a long time they're getting points for uh, long-term vacancy risk um, and tenant accounts receivable when you go clear over to the right uh, definitely having uh, issues and with a lot of the same properties. So we're getting a pretty good idea that uh, <clears throat> the, the, the problem is, is pretty widespread at this housing authority, but it's unfortunately widespread in their biggest properties. And we definitely need to uh, make a note of all these issues and start figuring out what, what more detail do we need to try to figure out what's going on. Um, some good ways to try to figure it out without going there. Um, you can always go to the internet. Now, we always have to keep in mind that the internet can be wrong. Uh, some people think it can't, but it can. <laughs> so anytime you're doing web research, you got to make sure, especially if you're looking for properties and pictures and stuff like that, you got to do enough due diligence in the, in the searching that you do to make sure that you're getting pictures. If you're looking at pictures, you can take the picture, you can look at Google Earth, things like that, to make sure that if you have an address for the place, it's a picture of something that actually is at that address. Um, this actually is Josephine Allen Homes. 
Um, <clears throat> so if you go to the internet and start pulling up pictures, you can get a good idea. If it's not a housing authority you're familiar with and you've never been there, 2.4% might not be wrong. <laughs> Uh, looking at this picture, and uh, and I can tell you that I've, I have been there, and actually it's not wrong. It is 2.4 percent, and uh, it's a property that was damaged in a hurricane, and uh, I don't remember which hurricane, and the housing authority shut it down rather than uh, going. They figured it was so far gone, it wasn't the first time it had been damaged that it wasn't worth fixing back up. So they moved everybody out and boarded it up. Um, so that explains a, a number of things. It explains the occupancy rate. I'm wondering what the 2.4% is now because it's completely boarded up. There's nobody living there. Um, but uh, also explains the long-term vacancy issue with, with this particular property. So if you go do an, and do that research, then uh, one of the other things you can do is talk to other people in HUD, uh, the Special Application Center. Um, as, as we saw on one of the first screens that we looked at when we were looking at the overall entity, there, there, it appeared that there were some units designated for redevelopment. So talking to the SAC kind of makes sense. We go there and we talk to them, and you find out that uh, two of the properties that appear to be some of their biggest problems actually have been Josephine Allen and Roger Williams Holmes. Both have applications in for redevelopment. The problem is the applications went in in 2011 and 2012. And they got stalled for various reasons, despite the best efforts of the people in, uh, at the field office, um, getting back to uh, management and governance issues. And, and are they easy to evaluate? No. Is there a lot of hard and fast data to figure it out? No. But uh, when something drags on for this long, and if you look at these timelines, the, there were some very long gaps where the housing authority was asked for additional information. And they didn't do enough to make sure that the information they tried to send in one case got there. Uh, and follow up to make sure that uh, they were getting what you want. If you're asking somebody for something, typically it's, it's, it's on me if I want something from Wendell. If I'm not hearing back from them to follow up with them to make sure that I get what I want, if I really want it. Uh, that was not the case here. So uh, as a, a brief follow up, I did find out about a month ago that these applications actually did ultimately get approved, but not until this spring. So uh, in the case of Josephine Allen, it sat completely unused for four years and running now because just because it got approved, it's not going to get fixed tomorrow. And Roger Williams Homes, in some ways, is actually uh, a little worse because it's only half shut down. It actually is half shut down, boarded up, but it's all one big piece of property. So there's people living in the units that are occupied right next to the boarded up units. So that's... Uh, as far as financial, so um, now we're going to spend some time looking at uh, the physical risk. So we saw the picture of Josephine Allen Holmes, and we can guess. We know that one now through the SAC thing. We know that's up for uh, redevelopment, and it doesn't look great. But we look at the physical risk and see what's going on. Um, at the development level, we can see past scores. Uh, there, a lot of them had issues with the past score, about a, a quarter of them. And then the trend, and we're going to go in and look at some of the details of each of these before, but these are the types of things that we're looking at as far as what goes into the, the physical risk at a housing authority. And remember in the morning when we talked about the asset, the asset physical risk and the environmental, that location, location, location piece, the PASS score really helps us assess the, the asset piece, what that, what that property looks like, how it's doing. That's where we can also use some of those internet sources that we, we trust so wholeheartedly. Um, looking into that, the the last three things, the Superfund, Flood Zone, and Neighborhood, are more that location, 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 that environmental piece. What's going on? Um, obviously, now we know that this, this agency had properties destroyed by a hurricane. Being in a flood zone is probably a risk for them, if not just physically, financially. Eventually, insurance money typically doesn't give you all the money back for what you for what you're insuring, unfortunately. Um, super fun sites, we do have some issues with that throughout the country. You know, If the cleanup comes in, if it ends up being a management issue trying to, to move people around, things to know. If this agency were in my portfolio and I got it and it was low risk in all the other areas except this. So all the stuff we talked about this morning, we're gonna pretend that doesn't exist 
and they have a beautiful, happy little world, and the only thing that's going on is that they're physical high risk, I would take a look at it and see that, well, past score and past trend wise, I'm going to want to look at that a little. But overall, a lot of their risk is coming from these environmental things. And so I would probably choose to accept that risk and tolerate it. I'd stick it in the back of my head. I'd know about it when I'm watching the news in the morning and hear that there's torrential rain in Alabama. I'm probably going to want to worry a little bit about my, my agencies that is in a flood zone. But I would accept that risk once I've analyzed it. And that's a really important thing that ties into what we talked about yesterday with risk. It's not always bad. It's the more you know. It's this knowledge. Sometimes we'll find out that there's something going on and it may be a risk. Just like investing in Apple was a big risk 10 years ago. That was a huge risk. Doesn't necessarily mean that I should have, you, know, you pull out all your stock and you stop and you burrow into a cave and you never come out. You just need to know it and stick it in the back of your head. Um, lucky for us, we wouldn't have this training if, if none of this stuff this morning happened, but all of this is going on. It's not just their physical. We know they have management issues. We know they have financial issues. We're getting at how that could probably affect their governance. So it's not just this physical thing. So obviously, we need to do more than just stick mobile in the back of our heads and forget about it until next round. We're going to go in and deep dive and see what's happening here. So now we know there's some physical issues. They're high risk physically. The next slide, we start to talk about why. What are those indicators? What are those things that show that they're financially high risk or physically high risk? Excuse me. So, pass score. Um, you know, we saw the picture of Josephine Allen. Uh, we remember in the summary screen was at 21% uh, insufficient data. Um, no big surprise now that uh, it's most likely the pass score that was the problem, and it's been shut down for years. So, no big surprise that they didn't get an inspection. So that that. It, without any more information, just using the tool, we, we figured out that issue. So uh, um, <clears throat> the other th names on the list, uh, same ones we've been dealing with. No big surprise there. Roger Williams, Thomas James, and uh, R.V. Taylor. And uh, continuing the, <clears throat> the concern that not only is it a current problem, but it's been going on for a while and it's getting worse. Um, they, they not only have... Uh, past score risk, but uh, two of them have past trend risk, which means that uh, their past score is bad and it's getting worse. So this is a place that you're becoming more and more concerned, not only about their financial, but now their physical, and this all rolls up to uh, what's going on with management. What are they doing? Why is not Why is this place not just bad, but it seems to be getting worse? What's, what's the problem? So um, we're going to try to figure it out. Um, Other places we can go to try to get some more information. What's going on? Why aren't they doing, at least appears, they're not doing what they need to do to make this place better. Um, the Internet, we talked about it earlier. You know, we've got to make sure it's accurate information. But, uh, you know, we looked at the MDNA. They're in the process of getting clearance for demolition. Well, yeah, we saw that. Now we have the details on that. We figured out that, yeah, they're in the process. But uh, they, they didn't follow up. They didn't get it done timely. Uh, they're also, what we can find out from the, uh, doing a little web research, is what they really want to do is redevelop everything, not just the two properties we're talking about. And uh, to the point where they, they have a plan, a $439 million plan, that they've hired three developers to help them work on to redevelop every property in their portfolio. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, you know, go talk to other parts of HUD. If you talk to the people at RAD, you find out that, uh, yeah, they did put in an application, but they were too slow to get it in before the uh, initial 60,000 unit <laughs> limit. They did get it in, fortunately for them, in, in time, but it had to wait until Congress increased the limit to $185,000. So it, it, is, it did get in and it, to be considered for that, but, of course, there's no guarantee they're going to actually get it. So... Um, all, again, leading to, you know, what's up with management? They, they seem to be focused on their grand plan to the detriment of the housing authority in, at the current day. They're, they got a current problem, they got a long-term solution, and it's not working out very well for them. So, uh, <clears throat> so delving a little bit into the HCV program, we, we talked in the morning, we're not going to spend as much time on this because it at Mobile this is one of their 
their smallest worries at the point, although we always know if, if one program's suffering, another program will eventually start to as well. So this is a screenshot from the PHA tools, the NRA tool, the PHA sheet, and we can kind of get a quick glance of what is going on for the HCV program. We see again there's some the quality assessment survey, the analyst had some issues, there's admin shortfall risk, there's a lot of participant complaints. Um, in the next slide, we're going to go in and talk about some of these a little bit more, uh, more concretely, some of the, the different parts of the HCV program that are playing into this agency's risk. Remember, in the beginning, we saw their moderate risk for, for HCV. We already know that we have to focus on that public housing side because there's a, a lot of things happening there that are, that are problematic. But if we completely take our hands and our eyes off the HCV program, one part starts to pull down the other. We want to make sure that they can at least make, continue to manage this program well. So one of the first places we can look is the HCV program, HCV benchmarking tool. This is in the PRMT, so it's accessible through that same portal. It does the same thing that the peer-to-peer -to -peer tool does. It goes through and it compares the agency you're looking at to their peers. And we can see there's some very subtle hints here. Some of the things where there's some of the places where mobile seems to stand out. And the thing about the, the program, those of you that work with the HEV program a lot know, it's a lot of push and pull. Just knowing how many vouchers are utilized doesn't necessarily indicate the health of a program. You also have to look at how much budget authority they're using, and you also have to look at how much reserves they have. There's a lot of parts, but you can start to get get a clue. We we can see from at the time that this was pulled, they're using 79% of their vouchers. So in the P, when we saw the screenshot in the morning of the PRMT, the, the governance, they were a little bit better, right? I think they were up to 83 or so by that point, just because of the point in time measure. But 79% is still really low. So we'd want to figure out what's going on. You can look at some of the costs and some of the areas that they're falling down. Um, they have significantly greater expenses than their peers. So why? What's happening? Is it that units cost more or what are, what are these things that are happening now? Why is it costing more to run that program? Um, they have a lot, almost three times as much for tenant services. What are these tenant service programs? We, we very much like agencies to be doing this work. It's great that they can, but if they're not housing people first, what is happening in this tenant service program? Are they, are they diverting money from housing folks and putting it into this program? How is that helping our communities? What's going on? Doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem, but why? What's happening? And then finally, one of the big keys, admin fee equity. They started out real low compared to their peers, and they ended even way lower. They're, they've dropped admin fee equity a lot. That obviously is affecting their their performance. What's happening there? Why? What is, where is this money going? Yeah, and we saw earlier they lost $1.7 million in the current year in this program. Now they're down to $0.25 cents per uh, on their equity. If they keep doing it, they probably can't do that for another year without going in the hole. So, uh, you know, while it is, you know, the public housing program is their biggest program. It's got the most problems. But this one, if they continue on this trend for much longer, they're going to be having to dip into money that they're not supposed to dip into. Some of that uh, restricted cash that we talked about earlier, part of that is HAP. Um, they can't be going into that to cover their admin for their Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, most housing authorities, if they run out of money in one pot, they'll keep paying their bills. So uh, we got to make sure that uh, we figure out, you know, work with the housing authority. We've got a lot of questions now. What's going on here? Got to make sure that we you know, do a little more digging, try to get a little more detail, and then figure out with them what is the problem here. You know, how come you're spending more money on average for expenses for a housing choice voucher program but losing money? Um, you know, they're not, be, not able to lease up. We're spending all this money on admin, but we can't lease things up. What's going on? Maybe it's a problem with the, the market in the city. Maybe it's not. Um, but if they don't get it fixed, they're going to be in the hole here pretty soon. So this chart also comes out of the two-year tool, which is in the PRMT as well, and it's the per unit cost analysis. And it gives us the per unit cost and then what the average looks like and kind of the general trend. And we can see generally their per unit cost is going up. 
So again, we don't know. We want to know what's happening. Is it that in this region, because of the hurricane, all the the units cost more money, and so they're having a harder time finding finding cheap places or finding maintenance materials? I imagine after a hurricane, a lot of that stuff gets destroyed. What's happening? We want to know. The other thing that's really interesting in this is if you have a good, if you talk to folks in the program offices and kind of understand what's happening nationally. So we know currently nationally per unit costs are trending down. So why is Mobile different? And there's often a very great explanation. Trends are an amalgamation, obviously, of many, many agencies. So just because one agency is doing something different doesn't mean it's terrible, but we would want to know what's happening. If nationally we're trending down and Mobile's trending up, why? What's, what is the difference? Again, this is a tool. This comes right out of the HCV uh, two-year tool. It's really easy. It's got a pretty graph, so that's always nice. It makes it a lot easier to, to see what's happening. As does this. The, the UNP, or what was formerly known as UNA, that this tool also comes out, or this graph also comes out of the two-year tool, and it shows us where they're where they're sitting with their reserves. And we, this is a, a pretty scary picture if you were to look at it. They have dropped significantly and are, t are continuing to trend that way. Um, the it's all in the admin fee analysis tab, but we can tell that their administrative administrative fees are not sufficient to support their program. So that that is something we definitely want to look at. They're performing okay right now. But if this is how they're trending, that's going to very quickly turn around. Yeah, and using these tools in conjunction, where you know we saw on the previous slide there the per unit cost um, looked like maybe they'd finally turn things around and started to get their costs going down, but then uh, you follow up and get some more information and look at this, and well maybe they have, but it's not enough because they're still you know they're going in the hole and it's getting worse. So definitely uh, a good indication there, maybe they, that they have uh, figured something out and started to control their costs a little bit, but uh, it's not enough and they still have more work to do. So, um, <clears throat> Moving on, we're going to talk about the COCC just a little bit, mainly because uh, without working with the Housing Authority and understanding what they do with their COCC, what exactly their organizational structure is, there's not a lot of data that you can just look at and figure out, but you can come up with some questions that, that uh, you want to focus on. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I mentioned my dislike for the word other. Um, they, they do have a pretty significant amount, given the total revenue for the COCC, of other revenue. Uh, it's uh, 71500 in green there, $500,000 a couple of years ago, still almost $200,000 in other revenue in the COCC. We want to make sure we understand what that is. Um, Another one, uh, proceeds from disposition of assets. Um, definitely want to make sure we know what they sold. You know, is it something that's associated with one of our programs that they needed approval for? Um, we don't know that from looking at this, but any, anytime they're, uh, they're out there selling assets, we want to make sure we know what they're selling, and if they needed the proper, needed approvals, make sure they actually got them. Um, and uh, administrative salaries, Fortunately, uh, you know, given uh, what we've looked at as a whole for the agency, you know, they're losing money. They're still losing money, but at least the uh, administrative salaries have started to go down. Uh, that could be a good thing. What we want to make sure as we go on and uh, finalize our questions and go start working with them, who did, did they just lower wages? Did they start laying people off? And if they started laying people off, who? Because uh, as we'll talk about a little bit, in a couple minutes, uh, you got to understand what the problems are at the agency and help them work through who should we lay off. You know, if they start laying off the wrong people, it could make the problem worse, not better, even though they're not spending quite as much money. So, um, <clears throat> That's all the detailed analysis that we have for this. What we're going to talk about now is... Uh, Based on what we've done at the housing authorities we've been to over the years, what are some things to look for? Depending on where you are in the country and uh, how big the agency is, uh, some of these things may apply, some things may not. Um, but uh, whether there's union associated with the housing authority, or if not, if they actually have employment contracts for certain people at the agency, got to make sure you understand what the terms of those are. And... Uh, 
and what, if anything, would happen if certain people are laid off. I have seen things like uh, union contracts at an agency that's losing money, has been losing money, uh, in the middle of a recession, enters into a new union contract with guaranteed wages at 6%, no layoff clauses, and, uh, and large payouts for severance if you, if you do lay people off. It is a contract. It's a contractual agreement, not necessarily anything we can do about that specifically. But <clears throat> knowing that and having detailed information based on this kind of analysis and working with the housing authority, what we can do is put together a pretty convincing package to go to the board and say, look, this is a problem. You can't afford this. You know, we understand it's a union contract. We want everybody to make a living wage. That's all great. But if you continue on this path, you're going to be completely out of money and nobody's going to have a job. So something needs to give here. Um, you know, and, and it takes kind of makes it, you don't want to make it personal. Having good data and understanding the terms of their contracts and being able to put together a package that presents just, this is the way it is. Here's the data. If you didn't know before, here you go. You know, could help. Sometimes it has, sometimes it's not. But, uh, you know, that combined with uh, salaries and benefits. There's a lot of data available on the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics website. All of the studies they do nationwide they have on their website, they're available for anybody to go in and download. There's a lot of good information on uh, pay scales in different regions, both private sector and public sector. They're classified by job, they have them by job classification. You can go in, if you're working with an agency that seems to have cost structure that's way out of control, you can go in and get information to demonstrate to them that they're paying, for example, their accountants twice as much money as most accountants in, in the government make in that area. Um, also, they have uh, <clears throat> good information on job classifications, what the typical qualifications are for different, different job types. Uh, a lot of good information to, again, try to put together a, a good package of information for a board to consider uh, when you get something that, that where significant changes are obviously needed. Uh, staff qualifications, like I said, again, uh, there, there is information available to figure out what qualifications should be. Um, also, uh, <clears throat> if you need to work with the housing authority to uh, go through and look at their staff and figure out, you know, who might need to move to another area. If you see things like uh, an accountant whose prior career was a daycare worker, <laughs> not necessarily the, uh, <clears throat> the most qualified person for that job and then promoting them to executive director when the executive director leaves, also maybe not the best move. But, you know, uh, that said, if you're out in a very rural area where there's not a lot of people that are qualified for or even willing to go there and do the job, you gotta work with what you have. So, uh, but you need to know that and know that you may need some more help. You may need to, if, if you have an, if that is your accountant, then it may actually be reasonable for them to be paying a fee accountant, a monthly fee, to help this person make sure things get done right. Um, now, if you have three accountants on staff that are getting paid the wage of an accountant, and you're also, uh, but none of them are qualified, and you're also, and you're in an urban area, and you're still paying the fee accountant money every month to fix the accounting because the three people you have on staff don't know what they're doing, completely different problem. But you can go in and get information to understand that, know what the wages should be, know what the qualifications should be. You can help them look through the resumes, see what these people are, you know, where they came from, and possibly make some change. Um, staffing levels, we talked about layoffs. We saw in the COCC that the administrative costs of salaries are starting to go down. Um, looking at everything we've seen at Mobile, one would think the first place you would start want to start saving money on salaries might not be maintenance, given all the issues they have with the quality of their housing. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that was the first place that they laid people off. So, uh, you know, again, just looking at, at the situation and making sure, you know, the nice thing is we have all this data, we can look at, figure out what all the problems are. We can know what to ask when we get there. When we start working with them, we, we can hopefully uh, 
point them in the right direction and, and get them to make the cuts where the cuts need to be made rather than where, where it's possibly the easiest. It could have something to do with uh, everybody else has an employment contract and those are the only people we can lay off without any cost. We don't know. But uh, definitely something to look at. Um, <clears throat> this was briefly mentioned earlier, fixing occupancy problems. Clearly there's a problem there in Mobile. They need to get their occupancy fixed up. The first thing they got to do is get the units fixed up. Then when they start getting people in, one of the things to uh, watch for is uh, getting people in the units is great. We want to house people. You know, there's a lot of people that need housing. We want to get them in. We want to make, make sure these units get used. If they don't do good tenant screening, a lot of times what, what we've seen at places like this where we've gone through and done the analysis, they start to occupy the units. They don't do good screening. The people get in. They don't pay. Now you've got eviction costs. A lot of times the units get beat up again. Now you have more maintenance costs to fix them up again, and you end up making your problem worse, not better. So that's the one side of it. The other side of it is uh, for the accounting, when you're looking at whether or not the place is getting financially better. If they do occupy a bunch of units, as soon as the unit gets occupied, you're going to record the revenue on the, on the income statement, whether they pay or not. That's just what's going to happen. That's the way the accounting works. If the people don't pay, your bottom line looks better, but the cash balance is not going to help your cash balance at all because they didn't pay. So when, when you're doing an analysis and, and you work with this place and they start to go and they start to lease up the units, when you're looking at whether or not they're getting financially better, you not only have to look at the tenant revenue, but you also have to look at the tenant accounts receivable. If both of those numbers are going up, then that's an indication that they're putting people in the units that aren't paying. Their financial, their, their bottom line may look better, but it really, it's just a, an accounting illusion. It's not really getting better. So, in summary, what did we find out? Um... Significant losses. We need to figure out, you know, what are they doing? Why are their expenses still going up? Uh, management, per perpetually low occupancy. Uh, they're not addressing their current financial issues. Physical, low occupancy, slow turnover, poor condition. Governance, uh, it's pretty clear, at least at this point, that uh, they, they were focused on a long-term solution to a current problem. Um, <clears throat> What did we learn about risk? Uh, as Bailey talked about early on, everything's related. Um, <clears throat> poor governance leads to management being able to do whatever they want whenever they want to do it. Um, <clears throat> that causes problems with the, uh, in this particular instance, has caused problems not only with physical, but their financial condition. Um, <clears throat> you have to look at the whole to figure out the parts. And for a lot of reasons, one of the most important is if you only look, go in and, and all we look at is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, we can start to fix that and cause a problem somewhere else. You have to understand what all the problems are, how they're related, what is this organization. Uh, in, in this case, it's pretty complicated. When you go in and ask them for an organizational chart, it's two pages all color-coded and very fine print. It was very complicated. It took a couple of days to just figure it out. Um, but if you don't understand all that, you can start and focus on one thing, identify a problem, start fixing that, and it causes a problem somewhere else. So uh, the, the tools we have are awesome. Um, we're going to keep using them. Hadn't seen them before we started putting this together. Uh, can definitely, you can't n understand and, and know all the answers to all the questions, but can definitely, without ha ever setting foot in a housing authority, go through and do a lot of analysis and, have, and, and understand what the major issues are. Have a pretty good idea you know the answers to all the questions before you even ask them. But given that a lot of our data, especially the financial data, is at least nine months old, you do have to make sure that uh, you have the questions, go ask the questions, ask for updated information, and work with the housing authority to make sure whatever conclusions we draw and whatever steps we start to take are based on the most recent information we have. Because something could have changed, for, especially with the financial situation in between the time that with the data we're looking at was submitted and the day we start talking to them and working with them to come up with a solution. 
Um, so, to wrap up, um, like I said, I've been over this a couple times in various ways, but uh, it's definitely time to start taking what we have, come up with the questions, figure out what additional data we need to fully understand what we think we know now, and uh, discuss staffing levels, look at the organizational charts, make sure we have a good current understanding of everything that's going on, um, keep an eye on news articles as you go, and work with them to come up with a, with, with a plan. So that's all we got. Hopefully uh, what we've been through uh, shows you maybe some, some things in the tools that maybe you didn't know that were there or hadn't used much. Um, and uh, the, the goal here wasn't to take four years of accounting school and, and 15 years of doing this and, and put it all in your brain so you can just walk around because that would be scary. It's my brain and you don't want to be there. Um, but uh, <clears throat> hopefully it'll make using, uh, using the tools a little easier, um, a little more efficient, and make our lives better. So that's all we got.